Jenny and Christine, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Jenny Finkel is a machine learning engineer at Mixpanel, and Christine is a future tense fellow and the senior editor at The New Atlantic. Sorry, The New Atlantis, my apologies. Um, so, serendipity. Um, this is kind of the fun part of the panel, I think, um, because as Ed and Jen and Ian talked about at the beginning, there's this algorithms tend to generally not surprise you very much. They will offer predictable things. Occasionally, they will offer you something really wrong. And then sometimes they will offer you something surprising and delightful. Um, my personal experience is I don't find algorithms surprising enough. I don't know which one of you wants to kick off. <laughs> um, but I feel as if when I, for instance, all right, I get a couple of different email newsletters, a few different email newsletters that suggest to me links. One of them is from Twitter, and it is based on the people I'm following on Twitter. Uh, and um, it, uh, you know, it offers me things that it, it thinks I'll be interesting, interested in. Another is curated by a guy who happens to be a friend and a colleague of mine, but even if he weren't, I would always find it much more interesting the things that Twitter sends me, just because he is an interesting mind. And he has more capacity to surprise me than anything that tw Twitter will send me. So is that just because I'm difficult? Or is there something wrong with algorithms? Or uh, is it that by their nature, they're programmed to satisfy the average and therefore not be very surprising? I think it's just that it's a really hard problem. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so like I kind of, I do, so I, like my background just for people is I'm, an, I'm a machine learning engineer. Like I have a, I did a PhD in this and now I've done kind of two startups that are very ML focused. So I'm purely a practitioner at this point and so I'm very in the data all the time. And you know, I really agreed with a lot of stuff that was said in the first panel about how when the algorithm does it right, it's really not surprising. Like for the company that I work at now, I built a model to figure out who was gonna start paying us. And it's like, oh look, the most relevant feature is people who look at the pricing page. Like that's not surprising, you know? And that means it did it right, right? If it shows you something truly surprising, <laughs> your model's probably wrong. Um, it's not that your model is so incredibly clever that it like, figured out something, right? All of these algorithms are written by people, right? They're not, it's not like the algorithm is writing the algorithm is writing the algorithm and something is just gonna, magically get conjured up that can do, can do magic, right? That, that, that's not how it is. Like, we're, we're still really bad at machine learning. Um, and so, like, to me, it's, it's like, so my, I, I was, used to work at a place that was a personalized newsreader. And so we really, you know, we tried to scour the whole web for links and then show people what they would like to read. So exactly what you're talking about with the newsletter, except it was just like a feed. And, you know, I would never advocate to somebody that you should get all of your news from an algorithm. Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Like, you're definitely going to have situations where there's stories that are of interest to you that are not related to any of your interests. They're not related to anybody that you're connected to. They're not related to any obvious thing about you. Maybe they're just, like, a big news story that for some reason, you know, it just caught your attention and you're, like, super fascinated by this story. Um, and, and it will never get that, right? The, 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 the system that we wrote, which did a very good job of recommending stories to me since I was one of the authors, you know, still didn't get me everything. There would still be like a big story would come up, like the FIFA scandal, for instance. I probably even said that. I'm not a sports person. I don't care about sports. But like, I thought that was really interesting. It's like a bunch of higher ups in this thing are all actually getting busted. Like, I totally cared about that story. I got zilch from my, my prismatic feed on it, you know? Um, but the, the feed still got me a lot of stuff that I would never have gotten otherwise that I was very, very interested in. Like, it helped me stay super informed about all of my interests, all of my disparate interests. I could just know, you know, what's the latest ML news? What's the latest, like, in the, like, the world of knitting? What's the latest in the world of interior design? And, and, you know, the serendipity was never, we never tried to explicitly model serendipity. Like, I don't know how you would do that. And so the irony to me was, like, the times that the model kind of, that did what felt like serendipity, like when it would give me an article about like a knitting pattern for some like mathematical structure or something that was actually combining interest in a way that I didn't realize people did before. To me, that was like, I got lucky. Like that was kind of what it is. Um, and so I think it's, it can be very good at finding you the stuff you care about. And it's really good at, you know, we can be very good at like just like the large amount of data. Like that's what it's gonna do. It's gonna go through the massive amount of data that you would never go through yourself and find you stuff that may be of interest to you. Um, and that's, it's really just like one part of the whole puzzle to me, I guess. I don't know. Right. 
Um, well, so I think one thing I'd like to say is that um, there is no such, you cannot manufacture serendipity, and thank you for saying that. I assumed I was going to have to sit here and <laughs> tell you you couldn't say that, but I mean, serendipity is the, op the opposite of serendipity is manufacture engineering. It, if you think about when we talk about a serendipitous experience, it's something that happens to us for God knows what reason. Um, when you think about the, what I think is curious about the discussion going on coming out of tech companies now is that they are saying we can manufacture serendipity. Why? There's a huge amount of hubris. There's an underlying, almost a moral argument being made there about this is what these things can do. And I think most of the people who are on the panels today are not making that kind of argument. Practitioners tend not to, to be. Um, tend, tend not to overreach in that way. But I do think we need to have a conversation as a culture about why we even have the phrase manufactured serendipity. It's ridiculous. And I, I think it does go back to, somebody mentioned the Uncanny Valley on an earlier um, panel. And what struck me is that you know the Uncanny Valley, when you see a robot that's so uh, human-like that it creeps you out because you know it's not human, we don't have an uncanny valley when it comes to algorithms, do we? What happens is that after the effect, after, after we find out that there's something that, that an algorithm or a tech company has learned about us that disturbs us when we find out they know it, then we kind of go, eh, this is too much, like the Facebook you know, uh, constantly experimenting on its users story, which as you pointed out, quickly died off. So I think the kind of cultural conversations we're having about these technologies are shaping our um, understanding of privacy, our understanding of what we can and should expect from our machines and the software that drives them. And ultimately, we're having the wrong kind of conversations because we're accepting wholesale a kind of tech um, Silicon Valley fueled happy picture image of, you know, let's manufacture serendipity. You can't do it. I mean, one of the things, because as you say, human beings design these things, they are flawed. We don't have an appropriate number of auditors even looking at these, these things and telling us through transparent procedures how to fix, fix them when they go wrong. Can I, what, I'm be, curious what companies. Actually, can I be devil's advocate for a second? I'm going to suggest that you have a, you're being a, an essentialist about serendipity. You're being the Antonin Scalia of serendipity here. <laughs> because. <laughs> then I've succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> because let's say that some social network service or dating app or whatever says to me, hey, you should really meet Laszlo from Hungary. Mm -hmm. um, and based on you know, some digital data trail that I've left matches me up with Laszlo from Hungary. Um, how is that essentially different from if all of various circumstances in my life led me to be walking down the street and to bump into Laszlo from Hungary? The middleman. The fact that there is a middleman that is placed between this um, <coughs> human relationship. And I think this, the one question I wanted to keep asking every member of every panel, and I'll probably pester you afterwards with the question, is what should we not be asking al algorithms to do? Much of what we're discussing is here are all the things we want them to do. We're getting better at doing this. There are going to be things that we should want them not to do. And there, there's this great E.O. Wilson quote where he said, you know, technology and science is what we can do Morality is the things we decide we shouldn't do. And that, I think, is a conversation we need to start having about algorithms in the same way. It's been going on in AI for a while, I think, and in science fiction. There's a rich discussion of a lot of these issues. Um, so yes, in some ways, I am essentialist, because I think when, if you'd bumped into Laszlo on the street, that would have been a deeply human and a deeply private interaction, and no one else would have known that you know Laszlo. And I have a friend who's worked Except with all the people the cameras pointing at the well, screen. Well, exactly. Right? No, no. But I mean, there's something to have a friend who never went on Facebook because she helped organize political dissidents. And if you ask her why she's not on Facebook, she goes, first of all, I don't want people to know who my friends are, and they don't want me to know." You know. So there is, I think, something. Um, yes, it sounds very luddite almost, but that I think is the difference. Right. Sorry, I interrupted you. You were going to come back on something that Christine I was said. actually just curious which companies you think are claiming to manufacture serendipity. Eric Schmidt was interviewed and said, we, man we can <coughs> manufacture serendipity. We can do that now. I mean, you hear the rhetoric out of Silicon Valley thought leaders all the time about manufacturing. There's actually, so is it Wayfair? Or, there's a company that, that has developed a, basically a, a muse an algorithm to give you good guidance through museums. And the person was interviewed, I think it was in Business Week, a couple years ago, said the reason that he decided to create this this app was that he'd been in the British Museum on a tour and he had a really awful tour guide. And the group next to him had this fantastic tour guide and he thought, Ugh, you know, human beings are so inconsistent. I want to be on that tour. So let's completely standardize this experience using, using all the 
wonderful tools we have. And when I read that story, I thought, that's terrible. I mean, you had the bad tour guide, but then you have a great story about your bad tour guide. Or you have He had a human experience that he found unpleasant, and his solution was to engineer it out of existence by creating something that would make that experience standardized. Um, and so I think that if you, I think, I spend a lot of time looking at what tech companies say about their product. Not talk, the people who engineer, the people actually making this stuff don't say this. It's the people who talk about it, I think. And, and there, serendipity pops up in a lot of the marketing for apps, any sort of, G, especially the new indoor GPS apps, the discovery apps. And by the way, you must be born because I share a Spotify account with one of my nine and a half year olds. And um, so he has his playlist and I have mine. And so I'm constantly being given recommendations for weird Al Yankovic songs. And I'm like, not again. I mean, it's, so I do think that you can, um, when you share information, you can have these machine-aided discovery tools. But that, I think, is still different than serendipity. But is that then just, so is serendipity just another word for, for more options? Or, or I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of wondering almost whether we're we're just arguing about words rather than about reality. Here. What do you think, Jenny? I definitely came in thinking we were going to argue the serendipity. <laughs> I mean, the semantics of what serendipity meant. That was definitely something that I that I kind of assumed was going to end up. I mean, I'm kind of on the side of like, you know, if it walks like a duck, a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Like, if it feels serendipitous and it happened to have been manufactured, like to me, it still kind of feels like serendipity, and it could just be that you know, part of that whole process of the serendipity was, you know, the computer in the middle at some point. But like, I mean, I don't, I guess I don't even really know what it means. To me, serendipity is just like when you kind of have a random thing that seems like a coincidence, but is like nice, you know? I mean, I, like, I don't even know what the formal definition of it is. And it reminds me, like my dad's, my dad always used to say when we were growing up, the biggest coincidence, I'm sure he didn't make this, but he was like, the biggest coincidence would be if there were like no coincidences. Mm -hmm. And it kind of feels, it, it, it feels related to me where it's like, you know, that like some like it just doesn't like things are gonna happen, things are gonna come together, and like maybe in this case it was that way, and in this case it was this other way, but it's just it it doesn't feel different to me. It's not like com the computer is some other or whatever that like doesn't get to count. And I guess like so I I don't read a lot of the Silicon Valley marketing speak. I try very hard to avoid it. Um, but so like so when I was actually reading kind of the the questions leading into this and it was talking about the quest to manufacture serendipity like which to me kind of seemed foreign because I'm like I never try like I just try to like get as close to the right answer as I can and then if I kind of mess up in a funny way it feels like serendipity but um like to me it just seems like if someone was actively trying to like manipulate me with seren with like manufacturing serendipity as a really explicit goal like you're just gonna pick up on it, right? It's kind of like the viral clickbait, and that's how like the first few times you saw an article that was like, you know, what this like where, where they like it's the new style that like the upworthy kind of developed, where you're like, you know, what this woman did to stand up against whatever will blow your mind, and then you read it and you're like, oh yeah, you kind of like said something to someone once, right? Like I don't like you, and you kind of click on those like two or three times, and then you realize, okay, this is just like man, emotional manipulation that I'm just like gonna tune out now, right? Every time I see a you know a an article that has a like, you'll never believe what number X is, I'm just like, I'm obviously not gonna click on that. And so to me, it's either like, it's crappy and it's obvious, and then you just ignore it, right? You learn it and you ignore it, or it like actually gets good, right? If, if Prismatic had actually gotten good enough that like people were just super pumped to read everything that they read and it actually found you awesome stuff, like who cares that an algorithm made it, right? It's like either it feels valid to you or it doesn't. And the, the source kind of just, just feels irrelevant to me. I think it's because to me there's no black box. Like, I know what the algorithms are doing. And so it's just a person trying their best to like figure out how to like show you the content you might like, right? Like, I have no malicious intent when I do that. It's like literally like I'm just trying my best. Right. But there is algorithm, or, or rather the people who make algorithms, I'm going to suspect or argue, have an incentive to make those algorithms work for as many people as possible, and that necessarily implies a certain reversion to the mean. In other words, as I said before, I don't think you're going to try as hard, or Pris Prismatic would have tried as hard, to surprise me, because it's trying to get a certain number of clicks from a certain number of as many people as possible, basically. Right? So it's reversing to the mean, whereas, so it, in other words, it's, it's optimizing for a large group, whereas my friend who curates the newsletter is really basically saying, this is what interests me, and if you happen to be one of the people who share my interests, great. 
I mean, to me, that's like the thing that makes it technically hard and therefore fun mm -hmm. is that like you want it to work well for everyone. But I don't, I don't see any reason why that automatically means a reversion to the mean. Like, like if if it, I mean, it may end up doing that, but that's certainly not. How do I put this? It's like we're still going to be tr like if our if our goal is to maximize clicks, like say our goal really is to just like straight up maximize clicks, like we're gonna do that by getting more people to click more stuff, which means like we have to be showing those people things that they wanna click on, right? Mm -hmm. And so like it, we, you could be cynical and say, okay, well we're just gonna try to show you like the clickbait, right? And it was definitely the case that like naive early implementations just promote the clickbait, right? Because people fucking click on it and it's just like whatever, you can't stop them. <laughs> I don't know. And then so we One actually, line, by the way. sorry, sorry, sorry <laughs> apologies. And so like, <laughs> um, this is what happens when you're an engineer and not a, <laughs> not a scholar. Um, but like, we, I mean like, so to us that, that was bad. Like we actually, I mean we definitely saw like, okay, this thing attracts clickbait and then you sit there and you brainstorm like, how do I get rid of the clickbait? Like what, what's the solution? It's not, it's, it's not like that the goal is to send you clickbait. It's, it's similar to the stuff where people were talking about where it's like the algorithm develops as the people use it, right? And so it's like if everybody clicks the clickbait, the model's gonna learn to show you clickbait. But like, you know, you've kind of got two options there. Like either you let your algorithm degrade and you let it sit there and just learn to show people more and more clickbait and then more and more people stop using your app because nobody cares about the clickbait and then you go out of business. Or you take time to actually evaluate your data. You look at what it learns. You look at a bunch of people's feeds. You look at what they click on and you begin to see the pattern. Okay, it seems like we have a tendency to show people clickbait. So why don't we add some features that try to identify that this is clickbait and you know, you know, actually, hopefully you will then learn that like these particular features that are a bit more nuanced are actually things that people don't like. So for instance, we even added a feature that was like, is this article likely to be a listicle? You mm -hmm. know, because it's like nobody cares about listicles and we weren't explicitly modeling listicles. But like once you can then actually model this is a listicle, then you can learn that people ignore listicles and then you can downweight them. Um, and so it's like you clearly need a human, but it's not, once again, it just gets back to this sense of like, like these problems are hard, right? Like the, the person who was up here earlier who was talking about like systems versus ML and they like to have, you know, zero to 100 and you know, I'm kind of happy with 70% or something. It's not that you want 70%, it's that you wanna solve problems that are not solvable with traditional techniques, right? Like there is no deterministic algorithm that is gonna produce articles that you're gonna like. Like I just don't know how to write that. There's nobody out there that knows how to write that. And so you say, okay, well, you know, I wanna find cool stuff to read. Like my current sources, they're not that great. Like I go on Facebook, it's an echo chamber. I go on Twitter, it's an echo chamber. Like, I'm just gonna try my best and it's gonna evolve and either I'm gonna do a good job or I'm not. But there's not, I don't know, there's not the underlying intent that I think a lot of people kind of attribute. And it, it, it's kind of, it's unfortunate because I think the marketing speak then just adds it all in. I mean, it's like you sit there and you just know the marketer's gonna oversell whatever you build and you kind of have nothing that you can do about it. Right. Um, <laughs> but. The echo chamber that you mentioned is obviously part of this question, right? Or the, or the filter bubble, as Eli Paris had called it, this notion that we're just, you know, we get the stuff that our, that we're, our friends are interested in, and so we become circumscribed, and then that ends up limiting our political discourse because we only see the things from, from people whose opinions we may, we may share. Do you think, either of you, that that is reversible? First of all, do you think it is actually a real problem, the filter bubble? Second, can algorithms themselves solve it. Well, it is a problem. I mean, I know there's some debate about Eli's particular model of the filter bubble, but it does seem to be the case. And certainly, anecdotally, you talk to anyone, they will say, if you look at, I'm reading all the same things that my uh, friends are reading. And I think it's why some, um, the, the online curators who do the best, people like um, brainpickings.org, there are a couple of really quirky sites where a human being with weird interests or a, you know, a broad range of interests, like your friend, just for the love of wanting to share that, creates something that then you know appeals to a broad number of people. Although, and I love her site, but maybe half the stuff on there is not stuff I'm going to click on. But the stuff I do find there is fascinating. I never would have found anywhere else. So it is a problem, the filter bubble, um, and it certainly has led to polarization of political and cultural discussion. Um, but whether we should turn to an algorithm to fix it is, I think, a question we shouldn't. There are so many questions we should be asking before we even ask that. And I think that's true of a lot of these algorithmic discussions, which is, I totally agree with you, I think a lot of what people are creating with algorithms are trying to solve a problem. But for a lot of these things, like who should be paroled and for how long, um, what sort of surveillance should we have of certain communities and for what reason, 
there's a f starting point about justice um, and about equality that an algorithm should have nothing to do with. Now, maybe you bring the algorithm in after you've solved these moral and ethical and political uh, problems, and you might not totally solve them along the way, but I do feel like the, our, our way of thinking and approaching some of these problems now, because the tools are so nifty and so incredibly powerful, is to start with the algorithm and go, look at what we can figure out. Like, if a gunshot goes off here, that means this person's car is likely to be stolen. And we get so excited, because it is exciting. It's powerful. But that's exactly why we need to first get through those tougher human questions, which are not going to be solved by any algorithm. What do you think? I kind of have mixed feelings, I guess. So I think that like, there's, there's clearly like a human element, right? If a human decides to implement a system that's going to decide how to sentence people, like, that human should be very confident that that is going to be like, a very good system before they make the decision. I don't think you can blame, if you have somebody whose job is to just kind of build the best system they can, and that system is not very good, and that system has a lot of bias. I think it's, it's mistaken to kind of blame the system. You, you should blame the, the person who chose to put that system into practice. But, and I do think sentencing is like a particular hairy one that I don't know anything about, and I don't want to make a lot of opinions on. But I think there are a lot of situations where people, like in the previous panel, people were talking about fairness, right? And it's like, is the algorithm fair? Like, is the algorithm going to particularly harm me as opposed to other people? And, and I think they are like, you know, my opinion really is sort of like if it's if it's if it's better than live ship it it's like if it's better than what humans are already doing even if some people you know someone's going to kind of get 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 the short end of the stick no matter what so the example that i'm actually thinking of here is like self-driving cars right i think for a long time there was like the beginning of the idea of self-driving cars and people were super uncomfortable with it and it was like what if a car gets into an accident what if somebody dies what if i die as a result of this algorithm what if my kid dies as a result of this algorithm and I think it's actually kind of, it's been slow enough, the progression that people have gotten sufficiently comfortable with the notion of like, you know, self-driving cars will have fewer accidents. Fewer people will drop, fewer people will die from car accidents if everybody has a self-driving car. You, however, may be the unlucky person who ends up dead, who would not have ended up dead if everybody was driving, right? The, like themselves, because it just, it happens to be that the algorithm in that moment had to make a decision between this car and that car, and it went for that car, and like, I'm sorry, you know? And so, you know, you could argue that that's unfair, but to me, in aggregate, that's still like a way better outcome, right? I'd rather have a, an outcome where, where fewer people are dying unnecessarily, or where, you know, potentially where fewer people are being sentenced, you know, incorrectly, even if it does mean that some people will have a bad outcome from the algorithm. Because in my mind, previously, other people were just having the bad outcome from a human, you know? <laughs> Before, a human died from a drunk driver, and now that human gets to live, and this other human who was just driving and happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, you know, dies, and that one's the result of an algorithm, whereas the first one was the result of a human. And I'm like, I don't really care. But as care. we said earlier, the, the difference is that when a human makes a bad decision, you can challenge the human, find out why they did it, maybe hold them responsible or accountable, figure out kind of what went wrong. And with an algorithm, that's a lot harder. You can find out, usually, I, if, if you actually are willing to dig, you can find out why an algorithm did something. I mean, it's not a mystery. But there's another part that we're missing here. It's not just fewer people will die if we have self-driving cars versus now, you know, it, it's not an either or because there's another thing that goes uh, extinct when you have an all self-driving culture and that is the human skill of learning how to drive a car. Now you can make an argument for why we shouldn't, we don't need the skill anymore, it's not necessary. But you know, if, if for some reason uh, something went wrong and the self-driving cars could no longer drive themselves, then where does that leave us in terms of our skills? Um, and you know, this is a debate that goes on with automation in almost any industry, particularly flight recently. But I d uh, so I think that, but again, the discussion becomes X number of people die here, Y number of people die here. So obviously this is X is better than Y. But in there is this whole human component that isn't easily quantifiable that is still nevertheless crucial for a functioning society. And in a lot of these debates, that's what never gets discussed. I mean, the toll booth operators, right? It's cheaper to have easy pass. It's more efficient. We can track everybody who goes through things. Um, but you know, then you lose toll booth operators. Those are human beings who had these jobs, who spoke to people, who, you know, there were wonderful interviews with the ones who, who were the last toll booth operators over the Golden Gate Bridge. I mean, some of them prevented others from you know, committing suicide. I mean, they were, they're human beings. So it's fine. You can, you can embrace a more efficient, algorithmically driven system in a number of areas of life. But we should have the discussion about what we're giving up, and it should include these non-quantifiable things. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't want to get too much into this, you know, this other question of automation and right. jobs and, and people and stuff. Um, there is something, though, I mean, slight tangent on self-driving cars, maybe, but 
there's, there's something that I'm noticing now is starting to happen, which is up to now, algorithms have been defining what we're going to see in, in the digital space, right? They define what posts we'll see on Facebook, what, what gets highlighted for us on Twitter, all of those sorts of things. So they are shaping our digital world. And what we're starting to see now is that they're beginning to impinge on our physical world. So, I mean, the most obvious example is the one that Ed gave of uh, Google Maps giving him directions, and he's sort of not even thinking, or possibly not even looking where he's going. He's just kind of following the map <laughs> blindly. And that, start, that influences what he sees. Um, similarly, if uh, the map starts, when Google Maps and Apple Maps start giving transit instructions, they, you may start avoiding certain subway lines or something. Um, or even certain neighborhoods because just the transport directions tell you not to go there. With self-driving cars, you also start to get a more mediated experience of you know, maybe which roads you go on, what you see on those roads, you know, what you experience on those roads. So very gradually, they start to shrink the boundaries of your physical world to the point where maybe we get to the point where algorithms start making it less likely that you will go to certain places, certain neighborhoods, see certain streets, do certain things. So that sort of reduction, is that a reduction of, is that a loss of serendipity, I suppose? Well, and if you combine it with things like ubiquitous computing and some of the um, wearable sensor technology that's being developed now, I mean, the massive amount of data that we can give off just by being living human beings walking down the street, um, you combine all those things, and yes, I think it does start, you start to live in kind of an electronic pen in the way that they do for veal, they're fattening for slaughter, not to make it dramatic. Not I'm just kidding, but, but no, but I do think that, that, again, those are the questions of how much autonomy do we want to give human beings because we're selfish, we're violent, we're a mess. We're messy, messy creatures. And the engineering solution doesn't like a mess. I mean, several people on different panels today talked about how algorithms are so great. You know, what a mess, but we get in there and we solve these problems. And they do, and many problems should be solved that way. But some of the problems that we wrestle with and will continue to wrestle with as a species cannot be solved that way. And when we try to solve them that way, we just end up creating a lot of unintended consequences, as several people mentioned today, um, or really kind of undermining um, real human serendipity. Well, OK, but that's, you know, we're going to have a mix of both. right? Well, so what, what, is, what exactly would you like to see that preserves the right balance? More. Um, cultural, political, social, legal questioning of these algorithms before we take them for granted, before they're actually out there and running. And I mean, self-driving cars is a, a really good example because already the laws are being passed in states across this country that say, yeah, we can allow self-driving vehicles. I don't think we've even started to have the ethical, moral, and legal discussions around. They're starting, but we should have been having those long before. And I think any time an algorithm um, algorithmic fueled uh, way of looking at the world or an engineering solution is imposed. I mean, there's, we, have, we have decades of, of you know, sort of engineering ethics um, and theory. And I think one good field to look to for guidance is bioethics. So if you look at bioethics, there, has of, there are often these moments where people come together and say, you know what, we have the power to do this. And now we need to ask a harder question, which is, should we do this? And ha if we do want to do it, what is the path that we're going, you know, Asilomar, there was recently one about this with genetic manipulation. Um, we need to be having those discussions in the tech space more than we are. I think we have a lot of hype. Then we have practitioners who are solving problems. Um, and we don't have enough, and we have wonderful tech critics as well. But I think we do need to be bringing these more into the policy space and into the legal space. I mean, a lot of these questions are going to get answered in the courts, I think. I think people are going to get sued, and a decision will come. And that is not the best way to answer a lot of these questions. Jenny, I mean, what tech, as I said earlier to David, tech moves faster than the law does, and than policy does. So like, what's, what's your feeling about that question of how to have the discussion in a way that doesn't slow it down? I mean, I, doesn't stop it? if I'm being totally honest, I think a lot of the, the concerns that I hope this isn't too inflammatory. I think a lot of the concerns that people have and a lot of the fear that people have is generational. Like I, I think it's I think it's like the older generation now, like the like basically my age and above is really worried and my age and below doesn't really care very much about, you know, your data getting out, people using your data. They they grew up with the technology and they see the benefits. And it's not that, you know, I'm not naive about the, the downsides of, the, of technology and giving up data. I just believe the upside is so much greater. Like, I believe the fact that I no longer have to navigate. I can just, I can just let the, the thing do it. It just it frees up brain cycles. It frees me up to do other things that I actually care about. It's like when we got cell phones 20 years ago and we stopped memorizing phone numbers. Does anybody miss memorizing phone numbers? Like, no, I don't think so, right? 
And so, like, I, I just kind of think a lot of this stuff is going to, you know, everyone's going to fight for a while. All the people that are fighting are going to die. And then it's going to be young people who are just like, yeah, it's my data. It's out. It's fine. And then they'll fight um, about something else. And they'll fight about, like, the next, the next version of it or whatever. OK, that's great. <laughs> All right, time for some questions. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, we have, OK. Well, one at the back and then this gentleman. Thank Sorry. Hi, Daria Steigman. Uh, this has been a fascinating discussion all the way around. And I wanted to throw out one more thing. And I agree with you about um, generational, because I just don't, I mean, I think there's some issues of, around health that are different. But the bigger question I have that no one's really brought up is the issue in terms of search and how we use this of personalized search versus incognito. Because I think it makes a really big difference in whether we're aggregating all the data, which really incognito is doing the best job from, from a broader thing than personalized, which puts you even more and more into a bubble. So I just want to throw that out. I don't know. Do you, do you want to say something about that? I don't have anything super insightful. I mean, I kind of think that the, you know, there was, just gener there was just incognito for a really long time, basically, and then they added personalized. And to me, personalized is just like, you know, it, it knows which like uh, like facet of the word, like which you know if it's a word that has more than one definition, like jaguar or something, right? It just knows which one I mean. It knows that I care about the sports team or I care about the car, and it makes like the car ones come to the top. And honestly, the the biggest thing I like about it is it just means like if I searched this before and I clicked on something, it's gonna like move that one up. So like to me, it doesn't feel like that bad of a of a of a um of an echo chamber the personalized search to me because it's like when you're searching, you're so specific with what you want. But I don't know, not, that's not like a great answer. So I don't know if you have something more insightful. No, just don't share your, you know, make, if you don't share a computer, it's a different set of questions than if you do in terms of personal search. Right, but from one generation to the next. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm from France. I'm between Washington and Geneva now. And both, uh, to both of you, the following question. Uh, in US, you have, uh, between 5.5 million to 6.7 million youths from 16 to 24 years old, out of school, out of job. Proportionally, the same situation in Japan is getting much worse in Europe. So this generational divide, or uh, I wonder, it, would you recommend, because uh, the life will continue, you're going to work hard, Silicon Valley, nothing will stop, I hope, but uh, I wish nothing should stop it, but how can we work on this divide between other cultures, other uh, generations, in this case, uh, and to address urgently this issue we have with young generation, as I said, from 16 to 24 years old. As far as I know, the White House declared it as a national security problem. Now, how do you feel in this gap if uh, somebody would ask you, uh, how do you address this issue? So you're asking about unemployment. Social. Uh, this huge social, economic, cultural gap between underserved and those better served economically, socially, and culturally. And most of those uh, 6.7 million, they, they, they don't understand very much about uh, applications, about algorithm. Uh, they have their own implicit algorithm. How do we address this? That's kind of outside of our serendipity, but I don't know if you want to say anything on that either. I mean, I wish I had a good answer for you, but I don't. Well, it does. I mean, one, one thing, it, it's not going to answer your question, and I think it, economists and political scientists would do much better. Um, but it did make me think of the fact that you're now seeing um, some of the tech companies, Facebook already, and some of the others are starting to be sued by the victims of terrorism, for example, by the victims of anything that happened that might have been organized online, which I think is kind of a fascinating pushback if you think about this in the algorithmic serendipitous context. So one of the, re one of the great things about our, these online spaces is that you do meet people in, who you would never meet in physical space, and you often find connection with them. Um, but this question of responsibility when, when incite, inciting violence or inciting terrorism happens, who's responsible? The people who you know, created the platform or the people who performed the violence? And I do think that, that the younger generation 
setting aside all the economic um, challenges they will face, um, they are starting to wrestle with this issue of how they want to live their lives online. And I do think that, I mean, uh, they're not going to Facebook as much anymore. They're, they're finding ways to mask their identity online in a, in a much more sophisticated way than any of us did. Um, there's a reason Snapchat was so huge, is that you know, these messages disappear. So I think in some ways they're a lot savvier. Um, in terms of having access to the online space, that's, that's, a, that's a, actually there are tons of people here in New America who look at that issue and brilliantly, so I would say ask them. Because, <laughs> but I do think this question of responsibility, you, you do see a lot of this now with Facebook and some of the bigger companies are having to tackle that. All right. Uh, so. um, I'd like to reframe the original question. Can algorithms facilitate serendipity? Um, for example, it seems that uh, with the, one of the, one of the, uh, the acti activity trackers, there's a quote I heard that, you know, self-deception covers its own tracks. So if we can have data that shows our blind spots and allows us to see things, if, if algorithms can take away something, and maybe, for example, Netflix says this is the movie with subtitles that people who never read, use, want movies with subtitles would like, or a documentary, or whatever that is, does that open up some possibilities? Does that, does that facilitate uh, serendipity? I'm a defender of self-deception, so you'll hear no <laughs> argument. <from me. laughs> I mean, I think it's st it's still. I mean, I think it comes down to the semantic sense of what you think serendipity means. But there's still, you know, a human had to sit there and decide that they wanted to model that specific phenomenon. Like, I think it kind of comes down to like there's so for movie recommendations, for instance, right? Like, there's a lot of and if you were just trying to write a recommender system for movies, like. There's a lot of aspects that you could consider, and you could try to be like, oh, what if someone's like their first time in a genre, what should I show them? Or if it's their, should I show them the series that they like? You can kind of think about all of these, these like one off questions that you could try to answer and that you could try to explicitly model. And so you could try to be like, okay, I want to get people to broaden their horizons, so I'll show them. Um, you know, whatever, they've never seen a subtitled movie, so I want to figure out the best subtitled one to show them. But anything that you do like that, it's like there's a thousand of those possible things and you thought of three of them and you kind of implemented them. And so it's, to me, that's just like part of your recommender system. And like the hard part is trying to, you know, do something at a somewhat meta level to kind of cover all the cases you like haven't thought of. Like that's kind of the, the hard part of, of machine learning is like, how do I handle the situations that I didn't think about previously? And, and like to me, that's kind of where the, act, the actual like algorithmic serendipity occurs because it's the, the part of the system that like, you know, you weren't explicitly like, I am trying to do X. Instead, you're like, I'm trying to do A, B, and C, and this other thing, you know, F appeared as a result of this combination of B and C. And so like, it's, it's hard for me to actually picture anything that's like an explicit goal like that really leading to serendipity in a, in a manufactured sense, I guess. Because I, I, it's, it's the bigger picture. We're pretty much out of time, but we'll take one more question really briefly. All right. Is this on? All right. Um, I don't want to be that guy, but I, I haven't, I guess this guy. is more of an observation than a question, but a couple times during this afternoon, Gideon, you've mentioned things about uh, people not having control of their data or data being cheap because they're not really paying attention to it. There's been a lot of there's been talk in earlier panels about uh, the role of transparency and knowing when you're in an algorithmic sort of monitored field. And, and sort of pulling all this together, I think one of the things that hasn't been really discussed here much is the question of design behind some of these systems in that there's been such a push in the last 20 years to make uh, our electronics and our uh, electronic mediated interactions seamless. And this push for seamlessness sort of erases, it, it erases boundaries, it, it, it removes friction, and those points of, of knowing where boundaries are or knowing where friction is are some of the points that give people a chance to grab onto stuff. Um, and if there was more, more borders, more seams, and less seamlessness, I think there would be a lot more potential times for people to be able to realize, oh, my data's going out here. Um, and I need to do something to stop that. It's kind of like that art, art installation that Jacqueline mentioned of the, the vibrations that go in and out of your phone. I don't know, is there a way to reconcile those two? Because obviously design and designers want things to be as seamless as possible, and so do users for that matter. Yeah, I mean, I think if you make things less seamless, your app will fail, and then the, the one that's actually seamless will succeed, and it, it, won't, it won't, you know, it, 
I, I think that's a kind of a non-starter. But I, I really do philosophically, I guess, believe this hasn't come up yet, but like, your data privacy is your responsibility, right? Like, you choose to use the internet, you choose to use apps, you choose to go online. And like, you know, you can, you can opt out of that. But like, it's, it, it really is your responsibility. Like, this is the world we live in now, where like, when you use websites, they collect how you use it. I mean, I hate to break it to you, but every website you use does experiments on you. Like, look up A-B testing. It's all of the time, and all it does is make your experience better. And like, that's on you to opt, you've opted in. And like, I, I just don't, I don't have a lot of sympathy for people who are like, oh, my data got away. I'm like, you know, encrypt it, know about it. So I am not, I'm the only person <laughs> on all of these panels who isn't on Twitter. I'm not saying that proudly, I'm just, I'm not on Twitter. I will be on Twitter. I have not opted into Twitter. I don't want my name on Twitter. It might appear on Twitter through, I, I did not give any, any permission for that. And you can't, people have jobs where they are monitored with badges that see whether they wash their hands after they go to the bathroom. I mean, they, you are, you cannot opt out of so many of these things. Some of them, yes, you absolutely can. Well, you, you don't have to, there's a very, think, you don't have a very high cost. High cost, you, yeah. I don't think you own all of the data that is peripherally related to you. Like, if I'm in a panel yeah, with you and I choose to tweet about that and include your name, like, I'm, I, I just feel like I should be allowed to do that. Like, no, I, don't, I don't think I have ownership. I, obviously, that's a free speech issue, but I'm thinking in terms of opting out. I think we increasingly we live in a society where you can't opt out a lot of, uh, out of a lot of this tracking and certainly of the surveillance. Um, I just, I, and if you look at workplace surveillance, right there you can see how many times. I mean, you, you have a choice of what, having a job or being tracked constantly on a job. And, and people are trying to fight that, but you know, they need a paycheck. So, that part of it gets gets my libertarian hackles all you know raised because I think that we don't we have fewer and fewer, few, less and less autonomy than we should have in some of those spaces. Just as the debate's getting interesting, I'm told I have to stop it. <laughs> so, thank you both. Thank you everybody else. Thank you all very much for sitting through this.